Hello and welcome. This is NTA Tuesday Live and I'm Cyril Stoba. Now last week, the National Bureau of Statistics released its second quarter report for the 2017 GDP that shows that Nigeria's economy grew by 0.55%. Now, the news was celebrated by many who see the development as a good omen for economic recovery. Of interest are the fall in inflation rates and the rise in foreign exchange reserves within a year. Now, going by the report, the GDP growth was largely driven by improvement in the oil sector. And this analyst say calls for concern. There are views that the recovery may be a weak one or short-lived if issues such as diversification of the economy and providing credible alternatives to oil as foreign exchange earner are not taken seriously. Now, how true is this? Uh, where is the place for Made in Nigeria campaigns and the reorientation uh, for Nigerians to produce what they consume? And what's the mechanism in place to translate the growth to food on the tables of Nigerians. And these are some of the issues we'll be considering tonight on NTA Tuesday Live. But first, let's get to see this report by Vivian Idekwefo. Nigeria, one of the powerhouse economies of Africa, slipped into economic recession in the first quarter of 2016. This came with attendant negative consequences as the country experienced a mass exodus of foreign investors leading to a further lull in economic activities. Government rose to the challenge by coming up with policies and taking measures towards a quick exit from the recession. Latest data from the National Bureau of Statistics shows that the country finally emerged from recession with a GDP growth of 0.55% after five consecutive quarters of contraction. This is an improvement of 2.04% over the corresponding quarter of 2016. It is also higher by 1.46% from the rate recorded in the first quarter of 2017. The report showed that aggregate GDP stood at 26.9 million naira in nominal terms, in contrast to 23.5 million naira in the second quarter of 2016, indicating a nominal GDP growth of 14.60%. Growth was largely driven by oil, manufacturing, agriculture and trade. The non-oil sector grew by 0.45% in real terms, which represents 0.83% over the second quarter of 2016 and 0.28% lower than the first quarter of 2017. The report elicited reactions. It is true that uh, we may be partially out of recession, but uh, most people have not seen it really that uh, we are out of uh, recession. Okay, no. Nigeria is blessed with a lot of mineral resources, human resources, whatever, more than any other country in Africa. Experts advocate for sustained efforts at diversification, citing increased budgetary provision to key drivers of the economy, such as agriculture, while also making a case for social inclusion. If Nigeria is to grow from this recession, there is need for massive development, there is need for massive agricultural inputs. So it is now for the government to really invest heavily in agriculture that will be able to sustain us. Then from there we can now say we are fully diversified from oil and gas. Agriculture is the key, number one, then followed by tax. If the mining sector will give you very quick and fast returns because based on the institute values of your mineral resources, you can actually begin to you know, ramp up funds. The gestation period is usually shorter. This is where you start talking about agriculture. In the wake of recent natural disasters, which analysts say pose a threat to economic activities, President Muhammad Buhari has pledged to drive harder policies that will ensure Nigerians feel the impact of the MBS report and the country remains out of recession. In Abuja, Vivian Idekbefo, NTA News. And that report sets the tone for tonight's discussion. Let's uh, introduce our guest to you. We'd like to welcome to this program 
Dr. Yemi Kale, who is the Statistician General of the Federation and uh, Chief Executive of the National Bureau of Statistics. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. We also have here tonight Mr. Amos Sakaba. He is Managing Partner, Chief Executive Officer, Good Ground Integrated Service. That's a consultancy firm that provides investment facilitation and support for foreign investors in all the sectors of the economy. Thanks for being with us here. Thank you very much. Good evening, viewers. Now, also joining us from our Lagos Network Center, we have two guests. We have uh, Mr. Moses Tule, Director, Monetary Policy Department of the Central Bank of Nigeria. Uh, thanks for being with us here. Thank you very much, sir. It's a pleasure. Right. And also in uh, Lagos Network Center is Chief Charles Okeke. He's uh, Chairman, IT Communication Trade Group of uh, NASIMA. That's the National Association of Chambers of Commerce, Industry, Mines and Agriculture. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight, Chief Okeke. Very much. My pleasure. Right. As we always do on this program, we acquaint you with the procedure. At the appropriate time, you can get to be part of the discussion in the studio. The various platforms will be on your screen. Uh, we advise you to take advantage of them and join in the discussion. Um, but for those who would be phoning in, we say this every Tuesday, at the appropriate time, when your call gets through, do us a favor, reduce the volume of your TV. Turn down the volume a bit. That's the way to avoid the hurlback or the echo. And the best way to know your call has been passed through is you'll see your name appear on screen. Once you see your name on screen, it means your call is through to the studio and just go right ahead. Go straight to the point, ask your question, make your comment. Don't bother too much about greetings, just go straight to the point. And uh, our guests here will respond to such issues that you might raise on this program. Once again, welcome to NT. Tuesday Live. Well, we're getting out of the woods, aren't we, uh, Dr. Mikale? But let's situate this first. The figures show that Nigeria has exited recession. Perhaps a good place to start is to define clearly, explain clearly, what's a recession in any economy? How does an economy go into recession and how does it exit? Because that's uh, probably what will help us uh, see through the various comments that have been made. You've heard some people say, for instance, say we have exited uh, recession. We have not seen it. Uh, so how do you go into recession? Well, thank you, Cyril. I actually agree as well that um, the first step is to understand what an economic recession is. Uh, most of the comments I've heard, uh, I think these people just not understanding what a recession is. And because of that, they're, and they're, they're taking making statements without fully understanding what they are talking about. Um, an economic recession is defined everywhere in the world. It's not mm. specific to Nigeria. When your gross domestic product, and that is it, your gross domestic product has two subsequent quarters, two consecutive rather quarters of negative growth. And by definition, once you turn positive, even if the positive is just 0.000001%, as long as it is positive, you are out of recession. That's what a recession means, plain and simple. Mm -hmm. um, issues of uh, the price of goods have not come down has nothing to do with the definition of coming out of a recession or going into a recession. They might be related, but has nothing to do with it. Whether or not there's good roads or whether or not education or health is there, or whether there's poverty or jobs has nothing to do with it technical definition of recession. You are in a recession once your gross domestic product, which is the value of your goods and services, mm. uh, goes negative for two consecutive quarters, you are in a recession. And once you can turn positive, you are out of recession. The other things they are talking about are on the side but have nothing to do with um, the definition of a recession. I think once people understand that, um, they, underst they would understand what it means to come out of a recession. Coming out of a recession just means that you are able to, you have stopped the decline, the slump in your economy and you have been able to stabilize and it is now, it at least it's not getting any worse. And that's exactly what it is. It does not mean that everything is now perfect. It does not mean that there's uh, prices of food that have come down or gone up. It does not mean that everybody has money in their bank accounts. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that everybody has jobs. That's not what a recession means and that's not what coming out of a recession. I think when people understand that, the definition and put it into context, a lot of the um, 
um, questions that have been raised about how can we come out of recession will be very, very clear. All right, but um, I'm, I'm sure you must have seen uh, so many of those uh, uh, comments yourself or heard many of them. There is also a group that questions the validity or the veracity of the figures that have been churned out. Some might easily say, isn't this political? Well, I think those that say things like that, um, in my opinion, are probably suffering from what I'll call political or statistical or economic paranoia. Um, the same agency, the Bureau of Statistics, with the same chief executive, with the same staff, that announced that we are going into a recession and everybody accepted it, they accepted the veracity of the, the computations then, comes and says 15 months after, well, we have turned positive from five, from five quarters of negative growth to 0 0.55. And then somebody is questioning whether or not the, the numbers were. What happened between the last 15 months when the office was releasing data showing negative growth? What would have changed? You can't say that this thing is manipulated because you have to ask yourself, why wasn't it manipulated in the first quarter of 2016, the second quarter of 2016, third quarter, of fourth quarter, first quarter? of 2017 nobody manipulated the data and then suddenly in the second quarter of 2017 somebody says it's, but it makes no sense it's completely inconsistent and that's why i say people that say that it's just political paranoia uh, this same agency mbs released inflation data a couple of days before saying that food inflation was the highest in nine years it wasn't manipulated then and then four days later the office is now manipulated again it makes no sense it's completely inconsistent and anybody that says that, I think, is just uh, trying to, it's, it's probably just political. I guess elections are coming, so people, when elections come close, people tend to play um, tricks with facts and data. It always happens, so I'm not particularly surprised. All right. I will return to you and look at the issues and what helped Nigeria to exit recession. But let's uh, uh, get the opening comments of Mr. Amos Sakaba uh, in this regard. Yes, thank you very much. I will look at it from the investment perspective because uh, coming out of recession tells a lot of stories about you know it sent the right signals to investors all over the world uh, we've been inundated with a lot of uh, congratulatory messages because it shows that Nigeria is set to restore growth and development and investors have been itching to take advantage of some of the major policy reforms that this administration has had embarked upon especially the executive orders you know uh, which really is a very clear demonstration of government's political commitment i mean the political will on the part of government to drive through reforms reform variety reforms that you know will assure investors that they are welcome into nigeria and that they can do business with government agencies without uh, the usual uh, the worries and concerns. So I think that uh, in terms of attracting and retaining investors, both foreign and domestic investors, the figures we are getting are sending the right signals and it's a proof that some of the measures, some of the policies that government had taken in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, coming out of reception, I mean the growth plan, you know, if implemented meticulously it will be the time to now build blocks on the coming out of the woods into actually growing the forest okay all right all right let's uh, let's go over to our lagos uh, network center and, and this one goes to the uh, director uh, monetary policy of uh, the central bank of nigeria mr moses tule i'm, I'm sure that uh, at the time nigeria went into recession you must also have been inundated with all kinds of uh, views and comments on the factors that were responsible for that. And now that the, the country is exiting uh, recession, also a number of issues have been placed at the doorstep of the central bank. Relate this to us, uh, if you will, what the monetary policy had to do with all of this. Thank you very much, uh, Siri. I think to start with, uh, Mr. Mo Sakaba got the narrative perfectly correct when he made allusion to the quality of macroeconomic policies. Uh, if you want to really see how countries suffer through 
a recession. Look at the example of Japan, or look at the countries in the Euro area uh, that have been in recession pretty long time uh, following the global financial crisis. Uh, it took pretty long uh, for them to even restart growth at all. And for us to have been able to get through this 15 months down the line uh, shows the quality of macroeconomic policy. And um, in terms of what the central bank did and did not do, uh, the central bank can't take credit all on its own that, uh, and then beat its chest that this is what we did to take the country out of recession. Uh, because uh, macroeconomic policy is a suit of policies. They all work together. So whether it be monetary policy you put in place, or it is action rate policy, or in this case, the interventions that the central bank did do, uh, they all work together with the suit of uh, fiscal policies and other structural policies all working together. So we, we can't, as a central bank, say that uh, this is what uh, was the policy which the central bank did to take the economy out of recession. But when you try to expand the narrative, we would, uh, in a very humble way, say that we contributed our quota through uh, ensuring that monetary policy delivered price stability to reduce inflation. That instills confidence and anchor expectations. That's what uh, we would also be looking at uh, the reforms that uh, took place in the foreign exchange market during the period. Uh, we would say that those reforms were quite fundamental in trying to instill confidence in manufacturers and other economic agents that had anything to do uh, with the economy. And that led to um, the building of confidence. And we saw how um, the inflow of foreign capital began. Even if you say that is portfolio capital, you can say so. but. Certainly, one thing we do know is that that inflow, which was not there at Benicio, led to the stability in the action rate, and that provided sufficient confidence for economic agents to leverage on and, and the economy to, to pick up. Again, the interventions in agriculture and other subsectors of the economy, again, the very humble interventions which the central bank did uh, participate in, and then the policy advice and explanations that were going on from time to time, all this helped to anchor the expectations. And I think these are all fundamental, but as I did say, all these were inputs into the suit of macroeconomic policies during the period. All right, thank you very much. We'll remain in Lagos and then go over to uh, Chief Charles Okeke of Nasima. Uh, and we just simply would just ask, what's your reaction to uh, the figures released recently showing the exit from recession? Thank you very much. I, I want to thank whoever, whatever operators that made this news possible for the um, organized private sector is a good news in the sense that uh, confidence, once is there, it encourages productivity, it encourages activity. A businessman who is putting money into his business would want to know that this money is not going to go into the air as a result of recession. So when government has announced with all the intricate uh, activities of different arms of government to work out the economy out of recession is a good news to, um, to Nasima as a body. And let me say this, um, it's quite coincidental, and I must, we must uh, take credit for that, that the recession is announced, the, the country is said to have come out of recession the very moment Nasima elected the first female president. 
first female president coming in at the quarter that Nigeria is coming out of recession. And it also coincided, I must say, when our own president came out of the unfortunate ill health. So these things are all coming in to show that Nigeria is on a very high level, growth level, and then uh, it's something that every person is going to be happy in Nigeria. Thank you. And uh, back here in Abuja, perhaps we might begin now to consider those factors that were responsible for lifting the economy, for the growth uh, that was witnessed. And some might say, well, 0 0.55, but you had said even if it was 0 0.0001, it was growth, the slide had stopped and they were able to build up. But let's look at the factors that were responsible for that. Um, we listed them earlier on, but uh, we find that major among those was the um, build-up in the oil sector. And not too many people are comfortable with that. Because uh, uh, is it sustainable? You know, agriculture played a role. We'll be returning to agriculture and see how much uh, it played in bringing the uh, country out of the woods. Well, um, crude oil was actually what dragged us into recession in the first place. So I guess it's, uh, and, and we understand why. We say that the economy is divided into the oil and the non-oil sector. Mm -hmm. The oil sector contributes about 9% of the GDP we are talking about, while the non-oil sector contributes the balance of 91%. But in the non-oil sector, there are huge aspects of the non-oil sector that are indirectly dependent on the oil sector. So, for example, manufacturing, like the director of CBN said, manufacturing is not a crude oil activity. Mm -hmm. But it, ma most manufacturing companies have a high imported input component in their business. Now, to be able to import those raw materials, Im to import those raw materials, you need foreign exchange. Foreign exchange, you go to the CBN. CBN's ability to give you foreign exchange is dependent on their foreign reserves, which are also tied to... Mm sales of oil. Right. So when oil goes down, CBN does not see foreign reserves are not are inadequate and they cannot supply as much foreign exchange. So they have to start managing the foreign exchange. So the manufacturers don't get the foreign exchange they need to get their imported inputs. As a result, they go to the black market, they have to buy these things at much higher prices. And that's what we had in 2016. But you will notice that as in, uh, in 2017, gradually the CB as the oil price stabilized, as the Challenges in Niger Delta, I mean, we, we heard about the Avengers blowing up oil output. So you had a situation in 2016 where your oil output collapsed and your oil prices collapsed, which means CBN's foreign exchange av av availability also collapsed. But you notice that as soon as the uh, production, uh, the, the, the dis dis disruptions in the Niger Delta stopped, um, there was st stability in oil production, stability in the oil price. And you notice if you look at the CBN's foreign reserves, they started growing. And because they were growing, CBN started pumping out more foreign exchange to the manufacturing company. And that, as a result, the manufacturing companies actually turned positive in growth in the first quarter and maintained that. Cycle. So you have a direct and indirect uh, impact of, the oil, of oil of about 60% of the economy is dependent directly and indirectly on the crude oil sector. And it cuts across a lot of other sectors as well. So once you get your oil sector, it's not, it's not particularly a good thing. It shows that the economy is very dependent or still dependent directly and directly on one. Um, I can say categorically without hesitation that if there are disruptions in the Niger Delta anytime soon, we'll go back into where we started from. And that's why it's important that we diversify the economy so that the next time that there's any problem in the oil sector, we have other sectors that can keep foreign exchange, um, the foreign reserves of CBN up that can keep the economy operating. But for now, the economy is still directly and indirectly heavily dependent on crude. And yes, it is vulnerable. It is um, very fragile for now. And until that complete diversification of government revenue and the economy is achieved, um, this, rec this recovery is also is also very shaky. And that's why um, congratulations, not congratulations. I don't think that's where we should. F the fact that the first major step which is at least to stop the slump has been has been done. The next stage is now to build on that and grow the economy. Right. And that's where the I think that's where the focus energy should be, not on concentrating on turning positive. And that's where we turn to as we talked about uh, talk about investments which you see and how you can build 
um, and uh, get to a stage where you, you would not be so fragile as it is now. <laughs> because uh, many Nigerians would scream to say no. <laughs> we don't want to see a situation where we'll slide back in such a short while. Yes, thank you very much. I think uh, it's very important that we note that some of the the issue of diversification had been on the cards since this administration came into being. And uh, you have seen that the recession itself is, I would like to say, it's a technical issue. And uh, being technical, the reason people are asking they've not seen the evidence of it practically or on their tables is because they are looking at it from the perspective of figures. But the truth is that what has happened, even the news that we are exiting from recession, builds tremendous confidence on the part of investors. And for the Nigerian economy to grow now, we have tested it before. We cannot rely on borrowing alone. We cannot rely on foreign aid. We, cannot, we don't have enough production to create the savings. What we need is to be able to attract and retain genuine investors, both, locally and, uh, both local and foreign. We have seen how local Nigerian investors have contributed to job creation. And we have seen how they've contributed to expanding the figures that he's talking about. And do you remember, record during the period of uh, when the rebasing was done, mm -hmm. the, the, the data showed clearly that the, the, the sectors that, were, that can drive the economy are, non -oil sector, is, are, are from the non-oil sector. So you find out that even new sectors that Nigerians were not respecting, like ICT, like... Uh, uh, Nollywood entertainment mm -hmm. were suddenly discovered that they are growth drivers of the economy. And we have seen a lot of activities in those areas. And we have seen a lot of attention in terms of policy on the part of government, in terms of creating the enabling environment that will, uh, that will attract and retain investment in those areas. Look at what's happening in agriculture. Look at what's happening in, in mining. The framework for mining is there. It is just to build upon it and create incentives that will support massive investment in mining. Mining alone can create all the jobs that Nigerians need. If you combine it with agriculture, oil is not even contributing significantly to GDP, if you look at it, because of the nature, the, its nature and its fragility. But if government concentrates on assuring investors and creating the enabling environment, as it has shown so far, in the kind of reforms they are initiating and implementing, in the kind of microeconomic policies and fiscal policies that have been put in place, you know, to give confidence and to assure investors that, you know, they are not only welcomed, they are being supported also to consolidate, to make, uh, to, to consolidate and operate profitably. Because it is only when investments are doing well that you can see reason to tax, I mean to collect tax that you mm -hmm. can do infrastructure. It is only when investments are here that we can create the job. Government cannot create jobs any longer. It is the responsibility of government to create the enabling environment by supporting private sector to create the jobs. They are the ones that can create the job. They are the ones that have the, the capacity to do so. So I think the investigation should be taken holistically and we should try to play down on this oil issue. Because oil has a limitation, and it, as he rightly pointed out, it took us into this recession when there was, there was some kind of instability there. But if we were to rely on agri, even manufacturing is picking up and is doing very well and is contributing GDP. So if we are able to sustain this level of growth, I'm sure in the next couple of quarters we should be really out of recession. And we will be in a position to, people will begin to see the impact of coming out of recession on their tables. People mm -hmm. will begin to see employment jobs being created. People will begin to see that uh, the, the, the economy itself is producing more. All right. So still uh, staying with um, growing this economy and uh, you know moving away from the fragility of uh, what we have just had now to exit the recession, let's uh, return to the central bank and see how uh, uh, its policies, because we have related... Uh, the whole issue to how uh, manufacturing can pick up and what manufacturing is to a large extent dependent on in terms of sourcing uh, uh, raw materials, for instance, and other inputs through the acquisition of foreign exchange. So let's see in what direction 
is the CBN going at this point so as to sustain this growth and uh, eventually exit the fragile, you know, uh, uh, area of, uh, uh, of uh, that we are in now? Thank you very much, Siri. Uh, let me start by saying that the Monetary Policy Committee had, in the last in the communique of its last meeting in July, given indication on the basis of the empirics it had em empirical research it had conducted the composite index of economic activity uh, up to year end, uh, which showed that. The country indeed was going to exit from recession, and we uh, indicated that uh, in the communique, uh, but that it was going to be fragile growth if, as if conditions persisted. Therefore, the MPC had called on the relevant agencies of government to ensure that we do things slightly differently uh, to ensure that. When we do exit from the recession, we, we actually have regrowth. Then if you look at the economic recovery and growth plan, uh, we have a projection by, that by 2020 we should be growing at 7%. Now I must uh, say that it is possible to grow this economy by 7% next year in 2018. Well, what, what do we do? Uh, I just want to talk about two sectors. One, I think we should place a key challenge at those steps of this government to at least let this government deliver to Nigerians the steel, a workable steel industry. That is going to revolutionize the economy of this country beyond proportions. Uh, it, it's, it's not going to cost more than $500 million dollars to invest in that Jokota steel industry to restart and ensure that that industry, the steel industry in Nigeria, picks up. It will transform every facet of manufacturing in this country. And 7% growth is certainly going to be a small thing. Now, that is just one plan. Uh, I want to mention the second plan, which has several been mentioned. And Mr. Sakaba just mentioned it, which is uh, uh, the mineral subsector. Why would we allow foreigners come into this country and feast as predators on our mineral resources? They're, they're all over the place mining illegally. And all that we need to do is streamline the procedures for operation and let there be perfect control so that government would get and Nigeria will get the benefits we deserve from mining activity in this country. That again would contribute significantly to growth. Now, if we look at the other subsectors, look at what happened to electricity in the data that NBS uh, just released. Growth of about 34% from quarter one to quarter two in electricity. We saw what happened across the several subsectors in the economy, which means that if we actually fix electricity, I'm not even talking of other infrastructure, if we just fix electricity, we would see growth that is even beyond the 7% anticipated for 2020. So th there are quick fixes, quick wins that we can just do. The government should just for once, just let this government take the bull by the horns and do it. Give us a steel industry that is working in this country and see if this economy will not explode. Thank you, Siri. Hey, Chief Okeke, okay, okay. three things now which I'd like you to uh, look at. Perhaps the issue of steel industry, which uh, Mr. Tule has just raised here, and mining. Of course, you heard uh, Mr. Sakaba talk about mining. And, of course, the role that agriculture played in shoring up uh, growth in this economy as to exit uh, the recession. Now, these are things that would be of uh, critical concern to Nasima. What is Nasima's approach here?
Cyril, let me also bring in, uh, Tule has brought in certain aspects of uh, activities in Nigeria that has never been given its due share. Let me tell Nigerians that it took one young man called um, uh, the founder of Facebook to come to Nigeria to let Nigeria know that any country that wants to survive tomorrow must key into IT and telecommunication. And that is why the present president of uh, Nasima thought that she must key in, her administration must key into this particular future. You agree with me, going by statistics, that California, which is the seat of IT, is the fifth strongest economy in the whole world. What does California produce? No oil. They are only into sil uh, the Silver uh, Valley. Silicon, Silicon Valley, yes. Where internet is the mainstay of the economy. Yalode Alabalosin has set up an IT arm of Nasima to key into this particular very important. I'm, I'm, I, I hear I don't I don't hear government talking about IT developing IT, but every country that means country now goes into this particular bit. So that is why Nasima is taking it very very seriously. Nasima wants to harvest all young. People in the whole of Nigeria, the 774 local governments in Nigeria, we must, Nasima wants to harvest all young people that have the entrepreneurial ability, the, the intellectual ability to go into IT development of applications and all that. Nasima will want to garner all of them and work with government for purposes of enhancing all this very important aspect of revenue generation. If Nigeria keys in appropriately into internet, internet development and internet related businesses. As at 20, 2016, IT I, uh, contributed about 1.6, if, if, if I'm very correct with that particular statistic, 1.56 billion naira into the, into the GDP. But when properly harnessed, when properly harnessed and supported, I can tell you, that is going to take over whatever agriculture, whatever oil, Nigeria will key in and be a greatest exporter of ICT. And we have the population, we have the vibrant youth, we have every key member. Look, it's a situation whereby every business in Nigeria keen into internet. That is when the Benue man that produces yam can stay in his house, a village man, and put his product in the internet and somebody in Korea will come and will immediately buy it and sell it off. So what we're saying is making use of the present uh, 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 technology that is available, which is ICT. And uh, I, Nasima is buying into that very, very seriously. But not forgetting also to, uh, to highlight the fact, facts of the, uh, the, the uh, this, uh, facts of uh, bad roads that have prevented even farmers from making use of uh, uh, tra transporting their goods. So the infrastructure development in Nigeria must be, in must be uh, uh, tackled very, very seriously. Moses has mentioned electricity. Electricity is, the debt of electricity in Nigeria is a pain in a lot of businesses that go on. So Nasima would want government to play its role actively in some of these very critical areas. And as businesses see these things improve, I can tell you the business of Nigeria Forward, it will be in the hands of everybody, and everybody will be happy about that. Now let's see how inflation, because uh, from the figures you released, um, we saw what inflation had done to the economy before, and then uh, uh, from your statistics, you find out that um, one of those things people applauded was that, okay, the rate of inflation had uh, considerably slowed down, but not to the extent, like you rightly observed, 
that people would look at and say, well, prices of goods have fallen. And uh, not really to the extent to say there's a stability in, in, in price regime for them to appreciate. Well, first of all, well, that's another um, technical um, misunderstanding that mis most people have. Prices falling down. Inflation. When you say inflation has slowed down, it doesn't mean prices of goods. Mm -hmm. When prices of goods go down, it's called deflation. Inflation is always a rise in price. So when we say inflation has slowed down, it means that the increase in prices mm -hmm. this particular period is less than the increase in the Mm -hmm. So when people, when we say inflation has gone here, it is not true because <laughs> prices in the market have not come down. They don't, it's just it's lack of understanding what, what, what it means. Um, you have to understand, to be able to stick, solve inflation, understand what is happening with inflation, you have to understand the two different drivers of inflation. You have um, demand pull inflation, and that is when people have just have too much money, and they, you have too much money chasing too few goods, and as you are mm -hmm. competing for those few goods, the, the, the producers increase their prices to weed out those that don't have enough money. That's, uh, so in that case, you have a CBN that will now try to pull out money from the, from the system because too much money is chasing goods, uh, which is what they often do in monetary policy, increase interest rates to attract people to put their money in the bank rather than spending it in the economy and pushing up prices. But you also have cost push inflation. Now, it's not because people have money in their pockets. It's because cost of production to the producers has gone up. And because cost of production that they, 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 there's a minimum they can put on their goods because of their costs. Now, because of their costs, prices are going up, not because people have money to pay for them. Um, when this happens, the, target, the way to tackle inflation is to deal with whatever is causing the increase in their, co in the increase in their cost of production. During the period of recession, it wasn't demand pool because people had money in their pockets. Obviously, people didn't have money in their pockets during a recession. It was because cost of production was going up. And cost of production was going up as a result of the things we are used to. Uh, electricity was weaker during that period. In addition, they were dealing with um, higher costs as a result of foreign exchange. Higher, higher mm. the, the exchange rate, the narrative dollar was higher. So until you can pull down their cost of production, which is what happened slightly, when CBN now started giving them, at one point the parallel the the parallel market was trading at about five hundred naira to the dollar. Now I think it's somewhere about three fifty, three sixty. So year on year, things have obviously improved. Now that's not saying three fifty is a fantastic level to be, considering we came from maybe a hundred and ninety. But compared to twenty sixteen, which is the point we are raising, the uh, things have improved relative to twenty sixteen. Um, how does this trying to maintain their profitability so they will do a lot of things they will lay off staff once they lay off staff you have fewer people that have an income fewer people have an income means they have less money to spend in the market the woman in the market is now going to say that uh, she's not getting enough business and she'll complain. That's how it affects them. They will also cut down other services that they had. So if a business, a manufacturing company had, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, advertisements, oh. services, they would say, well, we're trying to cut costs. They'll reduce the advertisements. They will cut down. Maybe they have a catering service. They would say, well, they can't afford this anymore. They'll cut. Now, when they cut out the catering service or the advertisement services, the, the advertisement company is also losing revenue. They will do exactly the same thing. They will also lay off their staff, reducing more people into the market. It's a vicious cycle. And it continues like that. Now, when you come out of recession, the reverse is the case. The company is now making money again. So it's a gradual process. He will now start by rehiring those he had laid off initially. Those ones come back. They now have a salary. The woman in the market now starts seeing gradually that people now are getting money. All the investments that they had sh 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 shelled because they are learning of money. They start introducing them. They start expanding. They start reintroducing all those services. They now start increasing advertisement. Now that they're getting money, they retain back the caterer, the, the people that supply them newspapers that they had stopped. They hire them back again. Those ones again start doing the same thing, hiring, and then those services they too had stopped. They start and then gradually. 
you start seeing a situation where jobs are being created. You get a situation where because jobs are being created, people are getting money. They are now spending money in the market. Then the manufacturer says, okay, I can now increase my production. He now increases production. You now get to a, a, a situation where production is now larger than demand. So supply is more than demand in the market. And then prices start slowing down. That's how these things work. It's a gradual process. It's a slow process before it goes from you've come out of recession to everything stable. It's, it's the same way it took us um, from 2014. The economy was slowing down. We didn't, we didn't go into recession. We didn't sleep and wake up and we're in a recession. It was a gradual process from 6% to 5% growth to 3%, 2% to negative growth. The same way it's going to be from minus 0 0.55 if we do the right things that we're meant to do, it will start building up. And in that process, all these other multiplier effects gradually start kicking in. And that's basically the way you move from your recession to your prices of goods and services, either going down or at least going up at a slower rate. Let's return to one, one of those uh, factors uh, responsible for the cost of production. And here I'd like uh, Mr. T uh, Mr. Tule to come in uh, because... Uh, the access to foreign exchange, which has been mentioned, uh, that's one of the interventions of the CBN. And I've always uh, um, uh, had people ask this, is that sustainable, this intervention in terms of foreign exchange, Mr. Tule? Uh, once again, thank you, Siri. Uh, let, let me say that the central bank does not end foreign exchange. Uh, by the mandate uh, given to the bank to ensure the stability in the value of the currency, we only manage the foreign exchange the way of exports. Now, in a situation where there is a shock to exports and we are uh, any less foreign exchange than heat or two, then definitely it has an uh, impact on how much the central bank can outlay of foreign exchange that the central bank can make available. Uh, that is why when we had the shock uh, beginning 2016 and there was kind of a drawback in terms of the huge exposure the central bank was uh, providing. There, there was a time where we supplied as much as $2 billion in the market. But what we discovered was that the demand for foreign exchange has no relationship whatsoever to the amount of imports that come into this country. So there's this kind of racket in there. People are demanding for foreign exchange under very auspicious circumstances, uh, very questionable uh, circumstances. Now, if you have that kind of a structure in place, it's extremely difficult for the central bank to manage the limited supply of foreign exchange that is available. Even people who demand for official foreign exchange at official rate and they export goods refuse to bring in, repatriate the process of such exports, they come back to the central bank again and demand for foreign exchange again. Central bank supplies to them, they initiate production, export, keep that process, come back again. You know, that kind of a thing, as if it's, 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 a, it's, it's an ocean that the supply of foreign exchange is unlimited. We have a limited stock, and in this case, it's so much dependent on the price of oil. So if we do not grow foreign exchange because we are not exporting enough, or the economy is not exporting enough, there is no way the central bank alone can meet the foreign exchange needs of this economy. Now, ideally, uh, what is supposed to be done is that economic agents are supposed to source for their foreign exchange, export, they, have, they export goods, produce goods, export, and then supply the economy with foreign exchange. And then from other autonomous sources, foreign exchange is also supposed to come into the economy and go out when the need arises. But in a situation where there's so much uh, dependence on the central bank to supply the foreign nation needs of the country, and for an economy that is as big as this, uh, I am not too sure if it is sustainable. It is not sustainable at all. And if you look at the kind of uh, population that we have, and uh, especially the youth population, then the need for the creation of jobs, 
if the economy solely depends on the central bank to supply the foreign exchange needs, it's certainly not sustainable and the economy cannot provide uh, you know, the kind of jobs that are needed to absorb the teeming population of the youth. So I think something uh, significantly different needs to be done. And so, some of, part of what needs to be done is the narrative we've been having here that government needs to make certain key investments and make it and know it is making this investment to take the economy away from oil. And one of such, as we did say before, is to ensure that the steel industry begins to work in this country. Not only will it generate domestic jobs, it would also help us to restart an export uh, uh, stream of industries across the broad spectrum of the economy. Then the supply of foreign exchange would be sustainable. We're in the steel industry. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, Mr. Tule has captured it very well. Uh, the steel industry is the backbone of any economy. And for Nigeria, we've got it wrong over the years. And I think anything that will bring back the steel industry on course will go a long way in resolving a number of issues that is affecting the manufacturing sector and even the infrastructure development. And I, th and I know also that in addition to, to the Ajakuta steel, there are a lot of investors who are interested in coming to do mining of iron ore and actually building state-of-the-art uh, uh, steel industries. But we need to have the policy framework correct. We need to be able to have effective coordination of policies because to, to, to do a steel mining industry, it involves mining, it involves Minister of Power, it involves a number of government agencies. So there must be a level of coordination where, a, a, I don't know whether it's a task force or that can deliver on a project of that importance, as he has highlighted. You, I think it, it was done pre in the past where power, uh, development of power sector is based on a presidential committee that brought all the stakeholders to work together you know, and deliver power. But we have seen also that there are a lot of variables that worked against it. But I think with the kind of government we have today and the political will this government has to drive reforms, I think there's no better time than now to take advantage of the situation and even the good news of our exiting from, from recession to put policies that will support the development of key sectors that will drive the economy and still is, 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 is one of them. The other one, like I said, is solid mineral. Solid mineral, there are many investors who want to come, but the policy framework is there, but there is no scientific explorations reports that an investor can rely upon to put in the kind of commercial investment. And some of the incentives also available in that sector you know, are not strong enough to attract mm -hmm. the, because it, it requires heavy capital outlay. And it takes longer period to break even in mining. And if government recognizes the, it will put policies that will support massive investment in these areas, and then we are able to move forward. Right now, money is restricted to those cement companies, mining, lime, uh, limestone, and the rest of them. And we need to have over 40 strategic mineral resources that are sought after all over the world. But we need to, in addition to the framework that is now existing, let us have a system where government can invest in the exploration stories so that these reports are made available to investors and they will see the, what is available and the quality and the quantum and be able to take advantage of it to put in their money. And I think if we do this, we will, be in, we will have massive investments in, the, in, in that sector and we know what that sector can do. It is also almost like intervention. I think I can tell you, Cyril, that in 2016, towards the end of 2016, we had a lot of challenges. Investors kept saying, those who had indicated interest to invest in Nigeria, those who had already started taking steps, started developing coal feet. Why? Because they cannot come and bring their money. 
invest in Nigeria and they cannot repatriate, repatriate the profit back to their country. They cannot even service the loans they took from outside the country because of difficulty in accessing in the allocation of foreign exchange. And we have seen probably it contributed to the reversal of the decline that we were experiencing in the manufacturing sector before we started exiting. So I think it is all these policies, they, they have direct bearing with investment investors. I think there is tremendous interest by investors to come to Nigeria. I think uh, on the part of Nigeria and Nigerian government is to create that enabling environment so that investors can come in and take up the responsibility that government now cannot take up. Government doesn't have enough resources just heavily in infrastructure. Unless, like today said, we can identify strategic investments that government has to find the money and And cascade to the on the table of the Niger average Nigerian. All right, it's um, said that the eventually be the key driver of uh, this growth that uh, Nigeria so demands. So, in the next segment, we'll be looking at what the sector can play. But before we do that, we'll take a short break, and we will, of course, as usual, ask the citizens of Nigeria to air their views on how this country can not only get out of the woods but remain permanently out of the woods. But uh, that would be in the next segment. Stay with us on NT Tuesday Live. We'll be back shortly. Nigerians, our fearless officers and men of the Nigerian military are winning the war against Boko Haram. Today, all occupied territories have been recovered and Boko Haram has been degraded. Our affected brothers and sisters are getting their lives back. However, they are now after you and me. In our mosques, churches, schools, motor parks, markets, entertainment centers and public gatherings. Be vigilant. Be security conscious. Report suspicious persons, objects and movements to the police and other security agencies. The security of our nation is a duty for you and me. Nigeria Unite Against Terrorism This message is brought to you by the Federal Minister of Information and Culture. The struggle for independence had been a long and tough one. Our founding fathers and compatriots sacrificed their comfort and even shed their blood. We cannot at this point in history afford to spirit away their sacrifices for immediate but temporary gains of today. Let us emphasize what unites and not what divides us. Working for the unity of purpose with a stronger vision for a better tomorrow. NTA, growing with the nation. Nigeria, the only country we can train with remarkable potentials to excel. Let us believe in ourselves and change our attitude for the sake of our country and generations unborn. Let us revive our cultural values which are our essence as a nation. Let us renew the spirit of patriotism and hope in our dear country. Do not take or give bribe. Be punctual always. No more African time. We can't expect to be global citizens and operate on African time. Join the queue. Insist that people are attended to on a first-come basis no matter who they are or where they come from. Nigeria, good people, great nation. Make you report any Kurukere person, object, or Wakajube movement to police and security agent demo. The security of our nation now work for all of us, so plus including me and you. Nigeria, make we unite against terrorism. Now, Federal Minister of Information and Culture, bring on this message.
NTA Tuesday Live, a network issue oriented innovation talk show. Thanks for staying with us. Yes, we said we took the cameras out to speak to the citizens. Let's get to here and see what they think about recession. If we have patience, things will come to normal. Because uh, this recession is a temporary matter. Uh, but everybody is still feeling the impact of the present uh, administration. So I think uh, what is necessary is for us to have patience with this government, which I know is actually doing their best to make every Nigeria feel at home. I don't even know really what. It is this time around I know what to call the socialists. Well, President Buhari is trying to let the whole world know what the average Nigerian feels. And I believe by that statement, he means that every Nigerian has to have a three square meal and it's unstable before he can rightly say recession is over in Nigeria. So I believe in what he said. Prices of goods in the market keeps going on on daily basis. Some time ago, MBS came up with information that Nigeria is out of uh, recession. But the truth of the matter is that that has not been translated into prices of goods and services. We have the rich, we have the poor, we have the people, the middle class. The funny part of it is that all of us patronize the same markets. Although there are rich people who can afford to buy things irrespective of the price. But my concern is the poor, the average, who cannot afford to buy things in the same market. The government should... Like increase in rice, beans, foodstuff like that, yam, the, all this foodstuff, the increase before, like that's Je December, January, like that coming down, the increase were so high. But last month, July, this month, it's going down gradually. Yeah. So, we're going down. Are you referring to the prices now? Yeah, the prices are going down actually. They are reducing. So, is that a way to say we're getting out of recession? Yeah, by God's grace, we're going to get out of it. We didn't save oil money when oil price was high. We didn't save for any days. And now the new government have come. There's no enough money, you understand? So Nigeria is a recession because of some elites of Nigeria doesn't want to see the Nigerians progress. They want to keep continuing recycling the so-called vested interest in the country. So if we don't overcome vested interest in Nigeria, we can never go out of recession. Vested interests have already loomed for the past 20 to 30 years in this country. And if we don't overcome vested interest in Nigeria, I don't think recession will come over. And talking of agriculture, ever since before I was born, I was learned that Nigeria were rich because of agriculture. And when oil was discovered, we just dump agriculture backwards and think about the oil. Now, the oil is going down, the oil, the oil wells are draining, and now everybody is talking about restructuring the country because oil money is going. And this, there is an economics from China that came down in here he did a two research, two years research in Kano and um, Niger State. They found out that these two states can feed Africa, not even Nigeria alone. So why can't why can't we forget about this all thing, all issue, and bring on agriculture as one of the basics? Because this is the first thing we learn. Where are the hills and the pyramids of Kano? The pyramids of Kano are made through agriculture. I was not born there, but I read it. You understand? But I know that those pyramids were, were, the, were the pyramids where they were extracted in building the three refineries in Nigeria. The ones in Patakot, Wari and in Kaduna. Alright. The citizens there expressing their views on uh, the Nigerian economy. So let's, let's go over to our Lagos Centre. And Chief Okeke... Uh, I suppose at the end of the day, growing the economy and uh, ensuring that uh, it remains robust, I suppose that at the end of the day, what really matters to many citizens is how to put food on their tables. Matter of fact, someone said the only restructuring that we should bother about is how to restructure the dinner tables and uh, get food on it. So 
what are the steps that this country must take in the short, medium and long term to ensure that every citizen can at least have something to fall back on. All the factors that were responsible for coming out of recession. Recession is like somebody who has a wound. That wound has healed. You don't want that wound to go back. So government must try and protect that wound and so that the, the tissues would have grown well. Once the tissues have grown well, then the person can be set. Anything that you want that person to be doing, you'll be doing. The economy must be protected from all the vagaries that were responsible. That is the immediate thing. Then, following that is all these other programs that are being talked about by so Moses. Moses talked about government investing heavily in infrastructural development that will sustain and outlive this oil matter that we're talking about, steel industry. And once steel is developed and handed over to good management, because I know, I remember that we had steel, steel industry, which were not properly managed, and that was why it went boring. So it's not a matter of just building another steel, but building steel and learning from the old lessons and knowing that old lessons are bad and we must have to discard them and put them into good management, even if it means having foreign counterparts that will give us the sustainability of that particular industry. That is one. And I have I've talked about Nigeria consciously going into encouragement of its youth in developing our own Silicon Valley. Nigeria has brains, children that have brains, they have them in quantum. It's only a matter of encouraging them and bringing them together. And I want to assure you, this is what the present leadership of Nasima has taught. And Nasima is going to bring you a crystal clear of structuring growth of young people and encouraging them in this ICT. It's a model which the federal government will ultimately, maybe in the next one year or two years, buy into it. But I can also let you know that we are not at the way the, the way it's being structured now. Nasima is definitely going to partner with the federal government in raising young professionals to develop who have brains to develop applications so that every business in Nigeria will tend to just like you have Jumia, you have uh, Udala and all that. There are so many of such things that will. So a woman that is selling rice in the market can use his tele her telephone to be doing those things by internet applications. So these are, these, are, these are structures that must consciously be put in place by governments because it is the way to go. It's, 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 it's the next tomorrow. That's what we're talking about. So that next started by the Alaba Lawson, the president, first woman president of Nasima. Showcase where we are going to. So that is talking about long-term plans, serial. Other things that must be done. And I want to I want to read from what I read one of one eminent Nigerian wrote sometime. He says, we must walk ourselves out of this crippling recession. And, and, and an undivided focus on agriculture linked to manufacturing looks to me to be a necessary and viable policy option. Agriculture linked to uh, manufacturing. This is, was a statement that was made by a, a noble Nigerian, Mazi Samu Huabuwa OFR. So when you're talking about agriculture, agriculture must be encouraged, linked with, uh, uh, with manufacturing and tied to IT, ICT, 
these are things, these are structures that must be put in place that will help this economy to grow further. I'm, I'm happy you, you, you raised the issue of manufacturing, and that happens to be your turf as well, Nasima. How do you assess Nigerian products and trade currently in terms of uh, what value uh, when, you, when, when, when you put them side by side with the products from other African countries, for instance, and for the products that Nigerians so desire, which are coming from uh, Europe and other, uh, coming basically from the West. I, I, want to, I want to say this, and uh, I want to tell you, part of the problem of Nigeria is the taste of Nigerians. Nigerians would always want foreign things. But I tell you, if made in Nigeria is enforced and encouraged, it may not be the best at the initial time, but I tell you, once it's been improved upon and all government agencies that will keep, like the SON eh, uh, and the other agencies that will that help to structure and confirm product viability and good and, and, and in, the, in the best forms, Nigerians should be encouraged to continue using Nigerian products. Importation of all this, there is no end to it. There is no end to it because we, our taste has so grown. That was when oil was booming. But now that oil is going down, our taste must be tailored down to be able to meet up with what we, we must start liking what we have in Nigeria. Even if they are, like I said, if they are, if they, if they are not in their best format. That is what India started doing. And I want to use this opportunity to also let you know that the Honorable Minister of Communication recently brought in, in the, there was this expo, Indo-Africa Expo on ICT. India has so perfected that now they are exporting their ICT. So Nigeria must start their own, even though it won't be in the best format, just like India was not in the best format, but they improved on it. Improvement is something that must be encouraged. So we can't, because our own, our own qualities, uh, products are not in the best of um, UK or America, we abandon, it. we abandon it. No, we must start using them now and continue improving on them until it becomes standard. That's what I can tell you, Mr. Let's, let's stay on with that for a bit, uh, Mr. Sakaba, in terms of uh, local, producing what Nigerians consume and consuming what Nigerians produce. Yes, thank you very much. I think uh, part of the key reforms that this administration has introduced has to do with the executive order pertaining to patronizing made in Nigeria products. And I think this is really revolutionary, but it has to be implemented for it to have the effect it will deserve. Because definitely, invest, um, definitely Nigerian products can compete because it's about standard, it's about quality, and we have seen the role of regulatory agencies in ensuring that we have uh, quality products. Uh, it has been reported severally that uh, the quality of our cables, made in Nigeria cables, are superior to the imported ones. And uh, so many other sectors, the quality of the cement we produce in Nigeria is of international, we are not ex net exporters of cement. So there are a lot of things that we can do, and I was privileged to, to visit uh, Angote's Egbeche plant, and I saw that the technology that is running that, that is driving that plant is state of the art. There is no pollution, there is no noise pollution, no dust hanging on the trees, and they generate electricity that powers that plant there on the spot. So it seems to me that, that Nigerians can do and can compete with any other country in terms of... And so government's position is to promote import substitution. If we are able to produce goods that can compete, Nigerians will have no business buying imported ones, especially because the price will not even be competitive. So I think that I agree that there is need to, to, to look at Made in Nigeria campaign and emphasize it. And the executive order even says that before you do any procurement, make sure that you, 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 you make available use of what is produced in Nigeria first. And this is really a policy that will drive and encourage local production of manufactured goods uh, and drive the import substitution policy of government. Uh, sorry, I want to 
comment on the ICT mm -hmm. uh, that OKK seemed to be very obsessed with. I think I agree with him entirely. Uh, ICT, in fact, internet is the next boom that Nigeria will, will have. Internet boom is the next boom. It will drive financial inclusion, it will drive agriculture, it will drive manufacturing, it will drive commerce. And I can assure you that the whole world is going di digital. The, econo the evolving global economy is a digital economy. And it is good that Nigeria should begin to invest in digital literacy. Let's get our youths, even if they are graduates, to begin to be literary, digi uh, digitally literal, so, uh, so that they can take advantage of the growing opportunities globally for people that can use ICT, just as Mr. Okeke was emphasizing. And I think this is one area that also can crave, create massive jobs, you know, that people can use. Thank you. All right. Um Let's 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 go back to our legal center and uh, uh, Mr. Tule. Now we're looking at banking support for um, short and long-term development. And uh, here, easily, the first thing that will come to mind is the interest rates and all that. And it's still not what it should be. And uh, there are still so many arguments back and forth. Yeah, uh, thank you very much again, Siri. Indeed, interest rates are not yet what they should be. And at the Central Bank, we have a passion for low interest rates. There's no doubt about that. Uh, anytime, anywhere, we support low interest rates. But uh, why we push for low interest rates we have an albatross hanging over us, high inflation. The inflation that is there now uh, didn't get to the level it is today because of growth in money supply. It was induced by necessary reforms. One, there was the reform of electricity tariffs and there was the repricing of petroleum products, and there was the issue of the action rate uh, devaluation. All of these three factors are known monetary in nature, and they fed directly into domestic prices. Now, in a situation where you have high inflation, high unemployment, declining growth, then you have a very big problem at hand. If the country was simply in a recession, the policy mix does not need to be so complex for any central bank to begin cracking its head over. i give you an example, Siri. Following the global financial crisis, the European Central Bank led by providing soft landing for the banking system and the financial system to restart growth in the euro area under the auspices of uh, an orthodox monetary policy. But up to now, it has not quite worked. The central bank, the European Central Bank, went into the market to buy instruments which ordinarily it shouldn't go there to buy. Now, this is in a regime of very low interest rate, yet they could not restart growth because monetary policy had reached its limits. But where we are here in a regime of high interest rates and high inflation, it is a choice. What do we want as a country? Would we rather have high inflation, and then the central bank dictates that, look, we must dictate to the banking system that, look, we dictate today, you must deliver a regime of low interest rate. Now, it can't work, because in 1992, when we transited to the indirect monetary targeting, it is very clear that of all the 
aggregates that we could let go or we could hold, the three of them, whether we are holding on to a price control or action rate or interest rate, the central bank allowed the market to determine the interest rates. Let's take the example of the, uh, the example from Kenya, where the legislators passed a law last year to say, look, you must cap interest rate at 400 basis points around the policy rate and nothing more. Of course, the system complied. But there's a complete dry up. There's no credit delivery at all in the Kenyan financial system now. That was the reaction of the banking system to that piece of legislation. So we really are in kind of a difficult situation when you want to lower interest rate in the regime of high inflation. Would we rather go the way of Zimbabwe, for instance? I mean, uh, it's unfortunate, but I need to mention it. As a country... We, 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 you don't have, you have lost your, the value of your currency. Or would we want to go the way of Venezuela? Again, the answer is no. Nigerians have a passion that they don't want high inflation. But they also don't want high interest rates. And they also do not want the Naira to depreciate. Now, those three, the central bank, there's no central bank that can manage those three simultaneously, Siri. And that's the truth. And that is why we have to allow the market to determine interest rates. Directly tied to the interest rates. And, uh, I mean, people who want to grow businesses cannot afford those rates. Uh, that's why people are saying that. So what's the way out? Out. Now, the, 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 the way out is when the economy is picking up. The economy is picking up. And as the fundamentals begin to improve, the Monetary Policy Committee study the data. We do simulations. We, we look at uh, uh, what, uh, uh, as if, as is, and what if scenarios. And on the basis of the results, the, the Monetary Policy Committee takes the appropriate decision. So there's no fixation on having a high interest rate regime. But honestly, for a central bank giving the mandate to ensure price stability in the economy, there is no way a central bank will go about reducing interest rate in the regime of high inflation. But we do expect that as the economy moves out of recession, certainly monetary policy will have a rejigging to ensure that it moves in symphony with the direction that the economy is expected to go. But it is got to depend ex on fundamentals and not on sentiments. Sentiments do not run macroeconomic policy. It's fundamentals that run macroeconomic policy. The fundamentals here as against um, a sentiment that uh, Mr. Tule talks about, but the issue still is fundamental to many Nigerians and that, okay, when it improves, it's not as if there is, I mean, a calibrated stage where you can say, yes, the economy has improved to the level that, okay, now we can now sit back and have lower interest rates. You, you look at the figures all the time. Well, actually, there is um, a level that you can say that uh, this is the right time for lower interest rates. I think what Mr. Tule is talking about is that in an economy, there are trade-offs. Um, in a perfect world, there's none. You want lots of jobs, you want low prices, you want low inflation, you are, there are trade-offs. You can't, uh, I, for example, I interest rates and inflation are usually, they usually work in uh, opposite direction. Now, I, I mentioned d demand pool inflation previously, that's when you have too much cash in the econ mm -hmm. economy. Now, if you int reduce interest rates, you're encouraging people to borrow a lot more money and spend in the economy, which pushes up the interest, the inflation rate with the same people that want the lower interest they don't want. And the other so it's a balance, it's a, it's, a, it's a delicate balancing act uh, with all this. Uh, you have to find that, that point where you have an equilibrium among this. But, but you can't have, like you said, it's difficult to have low interest rates and low inflation because low interest rates encourages borrowing, which encourages economic activity, which forces money into the system, which pushes up inflation. So, like I said, it's a delicate balance. Between but how does that relate to the other maxim again, that in order for you to grow an economy, you have to spend? Yes. That's why, as an economy, you have to decide which is more important to you. 
do you want economic growth are you willing to sacrifice inflation and get economic growth economic growth is good because it creates jobs for people so you have, you have to ask yourself do people do you prefer to have the economy growing so people can have jobs when they have jobs they can spend and allow inflation to go up significantly while that is happening or do you want lower inflation which at the end of the day can result in lower growth that's why i say it's a but and you can have both but there's a maximum amount of growth uh beyond which um uh, there's a sorry there's a maximum amount of inflation beyond which even you can't even grow so again, like I said, there's, a, there's an equilibrium point where you get, there's a minimum point where you have the, up, the, the right interest rates with the right inflation, with the right growth rates. And, and, and fiscal and monetary policies have to find that, that point. But it is, not, it is difficult to have uh, low interest rates, high, uh, low inflation, high, high employment, uh, high growth. All at the same time, it's just not economically feasible. And that's, I think that's what Mr. Tule is uh, talking about. So, but, uh, well, still back to how, how <laughs> we can ensure the best terms for Nigeria. Well, is it any surprise that many Nigerians seem to uh, be, be dumbfounded by all the theories of economists, and yet the basic thing is how to ensure that every citizen gets, I mean, the minimum at least, of uh, what, what, what's expected for, uh, if I might call it comfortable living, food on their tables, and be able to have employment. In any case, we do not see the level of uh, unemployment reducing at such a rate that people begin to appreciate the impact of all these policies. Well, I think every country in the world, there's no country in the world that has full employment. Every country in the world has some level of unemployment. Every country in the world. There's no country that has... Um, that everybody actually has three, three square meals a day. It's not doesn't exist. If you if you look at various articles in the UK and the US, you find millions of people that are having, finding it difficult getting three square meals a day. Now that doesn't mean that this is not something a government should pursue. Um, but like I said, there are trade-offs in an economy. You can't always, at the end of the day, an economy is supposed to do that cost-benefit analysis and find the best mix of all these things for its people. But there's no utopia. You don't, you don't, you don't, there's no way that, there's no economy where everything just fits in. You go to the U.S. that everybody wants to go, they have poverty rates, I think, of about 10%. People don't, don't remember that. They have an employment rate of about 4-5%. You go to any country in the world, they have these same challenges. These economic principles that we're talking about, that the, just like you said, the man on the street doesn't understand, are not unique necessarily to Nigeria. They are issues that every country in the world has to face and have to face it in the best way possible. So that's, that's the, the challenge that fiscal monetary policy have to face in every country in the world. It's not a, a, a specific uh, Nigerian problem. Well, yes, yes. I wanted to say uh, what uh, Mr. Tule talked about. I think you, you ask a very fundamental question. What is happening to the cost of funds? Why are businesses having issues accessing funds even in the wake of previous arrangements for intervention funds by CBN we still find that the development banks in Nigeria they are they are almost competing with commercial banks mm -hmm. when it comes to the, their management of uh, of uh, facilities I, I think that there's no reason why but like Bank of Industry should be declaring profit when it is supposed to push for development. It is supposed to give people access. People who have brilliant ideas, uh, bankable projects, they are not able to get because, of course, even, even if it is 9%, the interest rate, they will still bring other charges, maintenance, administrative, processing fee. And at the end of the day, the business is already dead on arrival. And this is what has created so many failures in the by by especially SMEs. Uh, I am sure Mr. K Mr. Okeke should be able to speak on that because Nasima represents that g group of people where they need they have good business ideas. They they need the money from development banks, and the development banks themselves are introducing practices similar to commercial banks that really does not give any subsidy or any uh, system that will allow them to, to, to compete, you know, within the 
against the background of inflation, against the background of cost of funds, against the background of even poor patronage that they had experienced over the years. Well, again, uh, Chief Okeke, just on Monday you had the other, uh, uh, another session of uh, the business forum and uh, the concentration here was the ease of doing business. Now with all these we have been talking about, is it any easier <laughs> to do business in Nigeria? As to, well, uh, Mr. Sakaba has talk, uh, talked about um, so many investors, both local and uh, uh, foreign investors who want to come in and play a key role here. But again, the question of the process of doing business. Doing business in Nigeria is uh, not very smooth. Um, Mr. Sakaba was talking about uh, interest rates, or you, uh, Siri, I think it was you who raised the question of uh, interest rates. Interest rate is the greatest bane, is the greatest problem that a businessman in Nigeria has. And that is why businesses are not developing in Nigeria. Banks are actually holding down businesses in Nigeria because of that interest rate. But let me tell you this other story, the one that has never been discussed or is not being discussed. The banks have this penchant for asking for deductions. There are deductions you see. There are deductions you do not see. I, take, I, give, I give you my typical, ex, a, a typical experience. I took a facility from the bank, one bank, and after running that facility for a very period of time, this bank was taking their interest, their charges, and all that. At the end of the day, by the time we, I exited, I paid off all the time. I was, I was approached by one consultant and said, who said, this is your transaction you did with this bank. Are you sure you were not cheated? I said, how? He asked me to print out my statement from that bank. I printed out from the beginning of that uh, transaction till the end. This guy went back and did all calculations. And within that period, he, was, he came back to give me a report that I have been charged by about five point something million naira extra, charges that I did not know. I said, what do I do with this? He said he is going to get this particular bank to pay this money. And I want to use this opportunity to thank Central Bank of Nigeria because he told me he wrote a petition to the bankers, bankers uh, uh, committee. A bankers committee now minuted it, or rather he wrote to the Central Bank. Central Bank minuted it to the bankers committee and they invited this or that other bank and presented him with all that. At the end of the day, that bank owned up and that money was paid back to me. Interest that we are charged out of the normal interest that were hidden charges. Yesterday, I was reading in one of these social media. One man wrote in uh, a WhatsApp. He said banks are now uh, charging, charging instruments. That you have, even in your savings account, you may have 60 naira as balance. And you, because you don't need, have a need for it. You, before the next six months, that particular 60 naira balance you have will now become no, become no negative balance so banks are now are always charging and charging and charging and charging and that is the bane of a businessman so while we are saying this i think it's, it, it, it will be the, the the best thing the best thing that will happen to us ultimately is government will put a lot more things into into structure to make sure that the businessman is protected. Business that is not protected will die off. That is why you have mortality rate of businesses in Nigeria. Banks are not friendly with businesses, and that is the truth about it. The apex banker and uh, uh, regulator is, uh, is seated next to you there. Mr. Tuli. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, um, Chivo Keke. Uh, let me start by saying that the 
Senator might take such issues very seriously. We have established a full-fledged department, Com Consumer Protection Department, and that department is designed by a structure to handle all consumer complaints across the broad spectrum of consumers of uh, financial services in the country. So whatever complaint it is that a consumer has with the uh, with his or her banker uh, or a corporate entity has, uh, once it's reported to the central bank, we take it very seriously. And that also includes issues of hidden charges and, uh, uh, you know, unnegotiated interest charges. We, we take such things very seriously and we, we handle them. There's a specialized department that handles such things. Now, uh, having said that, I, I think I would like to just make some contribution to the discussion on ground uh, on on interest rates and on um, on the credit delivery system. Now, going out of the global financial crisis, the kind of structures that Basel II, uh, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, put in place globally, and these are global structures, uh, as such that. Um, Banks globally now exercise a very cautious approach to lending. And that's a global phenomenon. It's not only in Nigeria. But it becomes a little bit more complex where you have a risk-free borrower like the government competing for funds with risky borrowers. The, the bank would normally lend to the government than lend to the, the customers. So the first issue is that the terrain within the country is such that the government is actively borrowing as approved in the budget. And the risky uh, uh, borrowers like members of NASIMA are also in the same environment borrowing alongside the government. Of course, the, the banking system would have preference we have resort to the government, giving them credit more than they would give to the other borrowers. The other aspect of it is uh, what Mr. Sakaba did mention, uh, the way banks are treating even central bank interventions. I think a brief comment on that would be that even central bank interventions crystallize on the balance sheet of the banks and not on the balance sheet of the central bank. So the banks take the ultimate risk even if a facility involves uh, an intervention uh, from the central bank. So it, it, it behoves on that bank or that banking institution to thoroughly interrogate the facility and get satisfied with it. So if you see the, the rate at which they are approving these facilities, is, if the rate is very low, it is because uh, they are afraid that they do not want uh, to grow the incidence of bad or non-performing loans on their balance sheet because all the liabilities that were accrued even from these facilities crystallize on their own balance sheet. I think that's what I would like to add on that. Thank you. All right. So, uh, gentlemen, as we begin to wind down, I find that we still have to talk about this other aspect, which is quite capable of uh, throwing a spanner in the works in whatever attempt there is to uh, firm up and sustain uh, the growth of the Nigerian economy, and this has to do with corruption. Firming up institutions and, uh, in fact, the enunciation of policies to a large extent is affected by corrupt practices both in private and public sectors. Now, you have also carried out a study, and quite recently, uh, the NBS was uh, uh, was heavily criticized for uh, the data it churned out about the rate of corruption in society. What are we seeing here? Is this related to, in fact, the general well-being of the nation? That's how the economy will grow. If you have all kinds of distortions brought about by corruption, of course, policies will fail. Well, um, I wasn't, I'm not familiar with the heavily criticized um, <laughs> part of it. Uh, I, from what I Glad that it was received um, by the Nigeria public very, very well because they felt that uh, it mirrored the 
their experiences. At certain institutions were well, not too pleased with you, were they? Well, certain institutions would not be pleased with any, any, any institution would not be pleased with any negative report on the institution. But I have to say that MBS did not state that anybody was corrupt. It was a study uh, bribery from the point of view of the citizen. So the study was citizens telling us about their experiences, mm. not MBS conducting any, any study on anybody or trying to um, undermine anybody's, uh, any agency's credibility. It's we go to the public and they tell us their experiences dealing with both private and public institutions in terms of bribery, and that's basically what the study was about. Um, I think we all understand the implications of corruption as far as the economy is concerned. It's, it has nothing but to offer but to slow down the process. For example, when um, an agency deliberately tries to slow down a normal process um, w because it wants to be bribed, first of all, it slow by slowing down that process, it slows down the growth of the economy. When resources that are meant to develop the economy are used for something else, of course, it's going to slow down economic growth. <coughs> if money that is meant to develop the power sector is um, is is taken illegally, it's not going to the power sector is not going to grow, and that means the uh, the businesses that we're talking about don't grow. Even when, in terms of um, the development banks, I'm not saying that was happening. I was giving an example. If there's a, if if government is offering small businesses interest rates at uh, at lower uh, 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 loans at lower interest rates, and somebody working in the bank deliberately tries to prevent those businesses from accessing those loans, uh, those lower interest rate loans, and asks for a bribe, and so it slows the process, it destroys the entire. So yes, there's a direct link between um, corruption and economic. The economy not growing. And I, 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 look, the Nigerian economy has huge potentials. Th those potentials have not changed. And I think one of the reasons why those potentials have not been achieved is because of this um, corruption. When you have to pay more than what you need to do to get the, a service that you're ordinarily entitled to. Um, from that survey, we estimated about 25% of uh, citizens' income being used to pay different kinds of bribes um, um, regularly. Now, if you can imagine if that huge 25% of people's incomes were going into the market, were help, helping to buy goods and services, it would, force, it would make businesses expand their operations, hire more people, um, we will have extra to export and more foreign exchange. But if I, ha if I don't have enough money to consume goods and services because I'm using a huge chunk of my uh, of my salary every month, every year to pay for services that I should ordinarily pay for, uh, should not get, then it reduces economic activity because there's less money for the economy to uh, to grow. So yes, corruption is a that st that study, in my opinion, was an eye opener. Um, we hear about the corruption from the other side, where we are hearing X amount of money was taken from an agent from a comp from an agency or from a company. But within it, it was interesting to hear the challenges that the citizens themselves are saying they have to go through that was a different way of looking at uh, we usually look at it from the company from the agency's point of view. it was from the citizens point of view where they say where 95 percent of nigerians said look they've had to pay a bribe of one in one way or the other in the last one year uh, and many of them saying that uh, it's 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 so commonplace that they don't even see it as um uh, as anything offensive. offensive. I remember uh, the, one of the interviewers, because we see the raw data, said that when he's driving down the road, now he doesn't bother to engage in conversation. He just winds down his glass and stretches his hand out. <laughs> Straight away, because he, he doesn't want to e engage in a conversation. Now, it's got, it's got to the point where we've accepted it as, look, I'm not going to get my license or whatever it is without doing this before I'm even asked. I'm, I'm already offering. And that's the system that and it squeezes the economy, it doesn't let things go uh, to uh, grow, grow properly. Yeah, we'll, we'll yes. yes, okay. Yes, uh, I think this is very interesting. Uh, but I think the issue of corruption is a key factor in investment location decision by any investor. Investors look at the corruption index of a country and see whether they can do clean business, you know. But more importantly, if you look at the ease of doing business executive order, mm -hmm. it says that every government agency for purpose of processing license, permit, or whatever from an investor or a businessman, you must display mm -hmm. predictable rates, mm -hmm. fees, charges that the, the person will pay. You must display the processes 
-hmm. the steps that will be taken in advance. You must also be able to show the time frame within which the service is to be delivered. Mm -hmm. My point is that if this thing is followed through, that's the best way to tackle corruption in the public sector. You create systems, structures, and institutions that naturally discourages corruption rather than depend on sloganarian and appealing to the goodwill of people. I think the best bet is to do to, to, to ensure that these policies, government should put in place a mechanism for ensuring that every MDA complies with those executive orders. In terms of, you go to any ministry, you see the licenses available, how long it will take you to get it, what you will pay. You cannot pay anything outside those fees because they are, they are known in advance, they are predictable. I think it's just like what we, we experience with power, electricity. In those days when we were using meters, where we were we using meters, Nepal will come and cut off your light if you don't pay. This day, you monitor your own prepared meter and pay in advance. You see, the system has forced you into direct compliance instead of asking, appealing to people to come and pay their bills or taking punitive measures of disconnection. You, everybody, every household head knows now that it is his duty to monitor the electricity consumption and to monitor the, uh, the meter and be sure that he is able to pay before the light goes off. So systems, structures can help fight corruption just like any other malice in, 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 in society. Thank you. All right, and so we'll take our closing comments, uh, our final words from our guests in Lagos, uh, Mr. Tule and uh, Chief Okeke. And uh, we're rounding off with the issue of tackling corruption, which is quite capable of denting all the efforts uh, to maintain the Nigerian economy on a sound footing. Siri, I'd like to talk about corruption and and the financial sector involving financial intermediation efforts of the banking system. Uh, you have a situation that has become a culture in the country where somebody in need of resources approaches a bank, whether a development bank or a commercial bank, borrows according to the terms presented by the bank, signs a contract, works out with the law and puts in place every obstacle to ensure that he does not repay the law. And when the bank makes recourse to the collateral that was pledged for the law, the person runs to the judiciary and the judiciary is, is, is very fast, very quick in granting uh, uh, injunctions, some of them perpetual injunctions restraining the bank from ever requesting the person to pay the loan back. I, I, I don't know, but I think, I think that as part of doing business, uh, what the, uh, the president, the vice president has signed, um, that should be one key thing that is on the agenda for the government to deliver to Nigerians. Uh, let me end this with an example. I, I went to South Africa and a young man that took me in, in a taxi, I, I found him so, so upbeat, very sharp, and I was forced to ask him, I, I, are you really a taxi driver? And he told me that no, he, he's not a taxi driver but that is doing this as a stopgap. I say, why? He had a business which he, he had been working in the bank. He left the bank, established a business. He took a loan with his friends, but the loan went bad. And he was blacklisted from the South African financial system from having any access to any facility for seven years. And he told me that until the seven years were over, he can't even pick up any decent job, neither can he have access to any facility in the system. And I think, I think this is key. It is something that needs to be done in this country. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Thank Sarah. you. And so quickly, as we've run out of time, Chief Charles Okeke, we hear your uh, parting shot in just a few minutes. Uh, Sir, and uh, thank you very much, every member of the panel. I, my own is, uh, uh, unfortunately, we, we live in a corrupt country. Unfortunately, every um, facet of the country uh, is, is engaged in it. The children, the, uh, it's unfortunate, but um, it, that's the reality, you know. Um, but with uh, the... The, the body language of uh, the, pre uh, the present uh, the government is at least shows that government is aware of this and government is doing something about it. It's only for it to trickle down to the system everywhere. And we're hoping on that. I, just like uh, Moses gave an example in South Africa, me, I went to China. A young girl was so wonderful in taking us around all the uh, sites we went. And then out, out of, out of, to show gratitude, brought out something to give to these girls. Thank you very much as a, as a, as a, as a reward. The girl vehemently refused that money. But in our own case, where are we? All right. It is on that note we must end this conversation and we'd like to say a big thank you to our guests in Lagos, uh, Chief Charles Okeke of uh, NASIMA, Chairman IT Communication Trade Group of NASIMA. Thank you very much for coming on this program. And uh, Mr. Moses Tule, Director, Monetary Policy of the Central Bank of Nigeria. We thank you for coming on this program as well. Thank you. Thank you, Nigerians. And uh, here in uh, Abuja studio, uh, thank you also to Mr. Amos Sakaba, Managing Partner, CEO of Good Ground Integrated Service. We thank you for coming on this program. Thank you. And as usual, uh, we are always delighted to have the Statistician General and uh, uh, Chief Executive of the National Bureau of Statistics, Dr. Yemi Kale. Thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Right. And also thank you to you for being part of this program. Unfortunately, this was one program that we had challenges with the communication system and uh, you couldn't get in your calls. Uh, we're sorry about that. We'll, we'll work on that and hopefully the next time we'll reach you, all those platforms will be working. But uh, thank you once again. Next week, we'll reach you again on NTA Tuesday Live. I'm Cyril Stober. Bye for now. Where no one blinks. Don't miss it.